Hi all, um, happy Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, of course, um, Thursday at one o'clock. We are here for um, Mental Health and Me, um, episode 35, and uh, we are going to see Sally Sigario, which uh, she just joined us. Um, the... Um, the, uh, I've lost my train of thought. I'm so excited to see Sally. Um, our, um, we're doing, it's, we just hit our one year. Hey, Sally. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so I was, uh, just saying, because I had nothing else to say, um, uh, that this is a uh, welcome to episode 35. Um, and this is the one year edition. Um, so we are, you know, one year ago, uh, you sat down with uh, Adeline um, and we're our first interview. So, and um, since then you've, uh, you've really taken over, um, taken over mental health in me. And um, so we're gonna sort of recap the year um recap the show recap the show. your year and um is that not what we call it i feel like it's a show um it kind of is i feel like ricky lake or sally just Raphael back in the days um but yeah it's similar to it's well an interview. yeah well <laughs> sorry maybe uh, sally yeah. jesse you were never a ricky lake maybe it's <laughs> sally jesse um I'm really looking forward to when the own network picks up mental health and me. I think it's just a moment, minute in time. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, where do you want to start? Why don't we start with, um, I guess it's, it's Minority Mental Health Month. And um, as someone who's a member of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, um, how how is um how is this going? How do you how do you feel about spending? You know, have you done any reflecting on like you spending the last year sharing your story? Well, what was really helpful for doing mental health and me and being part of the you know mean interviewer interviewers is I get to pick people who I want to interview. So I I pick my my sister who's also a presenter, and my okay. dad in the past this past year. And um, I learned more about my culture, our Filipino American culture through those because of the stigma associated with those stories. Um, for those watching, you can look at back episode something with my sister, Lisa, at episode something with my dad. He's the last one, right? 34? Episode 34 with Rami Sagaria. Yeah, for my, yeah Rami Sagaria is my dad. And um, so something I did want to mention too is that the picture I use for this, um, for Men's Health and Me, it's a picture of our old CEO, Brittany Wiseman. Uh, we have a new one, Trotty, Trotty Winters, who will be interviewing next um, in sometime in August. But uh, I put Brittany there because Brittany and Adelene were the ones that wanted to have kick off this kind of interview series on Instagram Live, Mental Health and Me. So it's Brittany, this shout out to Brittany and Adelene. Um, and, um, and in replacing Adelene is Davey. Davey is our NAMI Walks manager. So it is a privilege to be a year of this program because we get to catalog different kinds of stories throughout what we have 34 stories, including this one. So it's it's quite the honor. Okay, back to your question about men, for men, minority mental health. So it is BB Campbell, BB Moore Campbell. Campbell. Yeah. So um, she's actually from Nula, from from Nami Urban LA. So that's a wonderful story of how they were able to go through through the capital to get a minority mental health month. So if you guys get a chance on YouTube, go to nami.org and look up um, BB Moore Campbell, her story. There's like a three minute, four minute video where Nancy Carter from NULA talks about BB Moore. It's a great story. I, I saw it again today because I wanted to talk about it. Um, it, it wasn't for those ladies to push. I think BB Moore wrote a book called um, 72 Hour Hold. Do you know that, Davey? No. 
So she wrote a book called, it's in, it's in the, the excerpt from NAMI. It's called 72 Hour Hold. It won um, bestseller. And um, they use that. It was part true, part fiction. 72, before, and, we go, before we move on, 70 hour, 72 Hour Hold is referring to a psychiatric hold. Correct, correct, okay. correct, correct. So it, the, the women wanted something more for their children than, than just, you know, crisis. So that's where NAMI plays, plays, steps into play. And um, I'm very fortunate to be a recipient of NAMI services the past 10 years. So sure, you guys see me on Mental Health and Me, but prior, we were the reason. My pa I'm the reason why our family sought NAMI. Um, <clears throat> so I have had the pleasure of getting to know your mother quite a bit this last year uh, because uh, Cecilia, Cecilia Sagario is a angel um, and um, one of our just like super involved uh, walk participants. Um, and one of the things that um, I saw when we were in the walk comments, like somebody kind of shouted out your mom and said like, it's so awesome that you are so open about your story because it's so uncommon in the Filipino culture. Um, I think actually um, Asian and Pacific Islanders like lowest help seeking, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons, stigma, economics, um, language barriers, but 23% um, of people who have mental illness um, are receiving treatment. And so how has it been for your parents to really like break out of that and be like this leading voice? So in episode 34, my dad talks about that. Talk, we talk about mental illness in the Philippines, what he knew about it prior to coming to the United States. And um, he mentioned that mental illness is a no-no. And there was really no actual treatment treatment. Maybe she, he said like witch doctors or shamans. And he mentioned like his uncle or cousin eating, eating glass, like eating glass from a, um, a glass bottle. So they were that ill and there wasn't really treatment like that. So I guess when they came to the, the States, um, so my parents came during that time with open borders. So um, they both had their, their college degrees and they pursued a life here in the United States in California. And um, it wasn't until, yeah, Davey, I was in and out of hospitals so much. So I got ill at 16. I had my first psychotic break when I was 16 in high school. And then I had my next one at 23. Uh, years old but from 23 the next six years after that i was hospitalized 10 times mm -hmm. so they were fed up my parents were so fed up like there's this ridiculous there has to be something more and it wasn't till their friend and i mentioned this in my story on um, episode one because it's a university guys um in episode one i talk about how my parents found about found out about nami through a friend um their friend from the philippine community at their church and their friend's daughter was in nursing school. And she was in nursing school up north in the Bay Area. And that nursing student was the one that recommended my, my, friend, my parents to NAMI because she heard about it in school. Mm -hmm. So um, because there was nothing else, like the, the priest prayed for me. I had holy oil, you know, I had an anointing of the sick. Um, you know, the rosary was prayed for me. I was prayed for in the church and during mass. So there was, they were okay, my parents, but I wasn't okay. And that's what made the, the home chaotic is we couldn't get the help we needed for me. Um, so that's how like that when they, yeah, when they had no more choice, they tried on me. And the rest is history. Kind of, it took a long time, like history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, then as far as like, you know, kind of like the next generation of kids, like, you know, I know you guys are still strong with your community. Like, how has it been kind of educating, educating people around you about this? So right now, um, I do work in a sales job that primarily works with college kids. Mm -hmm. So I do connect a little bit easier with um, the Asian American community. Like at my church right now, I'm like homies with the Koreans. I call them the Korean, the cool Korean club. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so how it looks like now is the, 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 the support is different, the terminology is different, especially, you know, what happened. So the recovery model came out in the year 2000, and it's been 21 years since then. And the way that in mental illness is addressed is totally different nowadays than it was when I was in high school and college. Mm -hmm. So um, there is still stigma there. The stigma is 
is that people will always come to me asking help for their loved one who's ill, but they will never be the one to go to an actual class to learn. So that's the next step we gotta get. We gotta get the ones who are well in the family to go take those classes, the family, family classes. Um, because even though they're more willing, everyone's more willing to talk about mental health and mental illness, um, it's still like, oh, I have to actually go through a class. It's similar to like, you know, when you, um, when there's a like domestic abuse, right? And, and you, go, you go to court, um, someone's that, people that get abused, they still need to go to classes to deal and grieve, but also to learn how to take the steps to help um, with their household, right? I imagine to a certain degree, there's also like, I know what it's like to live with somebody who's mentally ill. Uh, what can you tell me? Mm -hmm. You know, you know how how is this going to change my life? I've already experienced. Yes, that. yeah, that's that's the attitude I get to for sure. Um, so um, for sure, more people have been reaching out to me individually, even at work. I have some of the sales reps emailing me or texting me or calling me about how to uh, work and live with their, their, their mental health conditions at church too. Um, people have opened up about like their loved one committing suicide or completing suicide, uh, decades ago, or so or their mom or their dad or sister having a mental health condition. So at least the conversation's being had, you know, versus before, like no one talked about it. Yeah. It was so taboo. Yeah. Yeah. Super taboo. Um, so I was reading this really interesting article um, yesterday, uh, coincidentally, on like the power of self-disclosure and how, you know, sharing that story can make, um, can really just improve your life. And so I was wondering, since I knew we were going to be coming here, what one year of having this conversation over and over again has been like for you? I know you said in your, in interview one, you know, you have, you were an in our own voice presenter, but you weren't necessarily sharing your story. You're like going and you're reading a script and you're getting through it. So what is, what has been having that conversation like for a year straight then? So uh, this, it was also, it's, it's pandemic year. So it's a little bit different compared to other years. Um, so I know, for example, some of my, um, some of my presenters, they asked me to not put their last name when I send out emails of who's presenting. For example, because they don't want their future employees or someone to know that they have a mental illness. Because there's some jobs out there, they're not supposed to, but if they, you put like, you know, certain keywords um, regarding mental illness, or you disclose it during your job interview, it might be difficult to get the job unless it is requiring you to have um, a mental health condition. For example, like Project Return, Peer Network, they, those jobs are reserved for people with a mental health condition. Um, but this past year, it hasn't been really me talking. It's about me listening. I say that because as a coordinator, um, a lot of people needed work. So they, I wouldn't take too many slots, slots for me to speak and present. So I would just have them, um, have them present. And um, it's been really nice to have community with my presenters, with our team, because in the beginning, we had like once a month meetings. Um, the past couple months, we had once a month meetings on Zoom. We even had a beach party um, in April. And um, it's uh, been uh, different, but I feel more united. Like right now, I'm working full time with my other job. And I'm like, hey, guys, here's all the information in the, on the folder. You have access to it. And then been, they've been doing really well. Um, I probably shouldn't announce that publicly because we have a new boss. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But in terms of um, sharing my story, it's just listening to others, especially doing this, listening to how people's struggles are unique to them, but their, their burdens are something we can carry together. Um, there are, I was blown away by what people shared on this interview, you know, knowing it's public. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's an honor. Like even with you, Davey, I just, there's a lot of things I didn't know about you that, you know, you shared during your interview before NAMI walks. And like you mentioned in the article you're reading, it's so important to share that because when you share that, there's a release there. And uh, my presenters in the beginning were just like you mentioned, were just reading their script. And I, the, the goal for all the presenters I have for them is to, you know, first nail their script, but also, after a while, learn to present to connect because that makes the biggest impact is to present to connect. A quick second and talk about what these presentations are for anybody who may be um, not in the know. 
<laughs> interested. Uh, there may or may not be a training. Yeah, may or may not be a training this happening this um, fall or not. So I'm the Inner Voice coordinator for NAMI GLAC. So Inner Voice is a program where um, two presenters speak about their lived experience, and there's a script along with videos, and they go to all with kinds of. Pardon me. Yes. So lived experience with mental illness. Correct live experience with mental illness and they go all over LA County um, to, uh, to like colleges, to health providers, um, businesses, organizations. In the past year, we did it on, on Zoom and WebEx and even Microsoft Teams. And um, it's such a powerful program because people, the most, the most evaluations I get f from the audience is regarding how it's nice to see people be open and raw about their mental health conditions. Um, Cause we're not, we're not clinicians, we're not therapists, we're just regular people that have a mental health condition. Taking signups for people who want to present, is that what you just said? I didn't say anything. I thought you were, you were doing a new training. Um, oh no, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. So, okay, we're doing ETS, that's ending the silence, I'm the trainer for that, that's for high schools. But that's happening more like most likely than another training of inner voice because we have a lot of a lot of people um, already. But if we do inner voice training, it'll be a refresher. So those that are on, there's a refresher coming because um, some of our clients want us in person. And I do know that we are um, always looking for more schools, middle schools, high schools to uh, present in ending the silence at. So if um, if any of y'all out there have a student um, and you'd like to see that presented in your school, get in touch. Let's, let's see if we can move that forward. Um, so, all right. So you have spent the last year telling your story and your last episode was with your dad. Um, and I think uh, you and I just talked right after that. And um, you said that um, when your dad described you having, you know, kind of your last big episode, like you had no recollection of that. Um, you know, what was it like hearing that? So, okay, so you guys have to look back at episode 34. So when you said episode, they meant 34, not my last psychotic break. So my last episode was in 2012. My actual psychotic break was in 2012, or hospitalization. I still get episodes, but they're not as dramatic or as not, as, they're not as intense. So my last hospitalization was in 2012. Um, and my dad was recollecting um, parts of my episode. And I remember some of them, but I don't remember in the timeline he was saying it in. And um, I already knew that was hard. I already knew that my interview, my dad, me interviewing my dad would be hard. I already knew because he was there all the time when I was ill. And I even asked like my church to pray for me uh, regarding that episode, episode 34, the interview, because I knew it was gonna be hard. And I just really, Jay, Davey had to like really bite my tongue and let him tell the story, his story from his point of view. Um, but yeah, I was sweating a lot and definitely triggers, but not, not as intense. Uh, triggers of memory, but not triggers of like who I am today. Because I was, like, I was so disconnected from that person that he was describing. He was describing um, like my first, the first couple episodes. I think he made it into one, one, one episode, but it was, it was the first couple. And I was doing all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, we live in a gated community. So it's easy to do stuff because it's gated. And um, he mentioned something about cops pulling a gun at me. I don't think that happened. I confirmed that with my sisters and my mom. They're like, ah, I don't think that happened. But I think they had guns because they were carrying them. But I don't think they pulled a gun on me. They pulled a flashlight on me. But, but for my dad, you know, in terms of the experience of how um, it was so matter of fact for him, like, there's like no emotion. <laughs> he just like, fact, fact, fact. I like, dad, tell like your story. Don't tell my story. Um, but it gave me a lot of confidence today. And it gave me a lot of assurance because we're not that family anymore. You know, the family that's always stressed, the family that always had cops over at our house. So I'm very thankful that that's not longer the case for us. Okay, um, and then kind of shifting gears. We, um, so another thing that we've been doing this last year, um, in addition to filming this show is um, remaining in quarantine. Um, but you know, it's kind of coming to an end and uh, 
one of the things I've been reading a lot on is how people with um, mental illness should prepare for kind of the end of quarantine. Like, you know, the shift back into life, the shift out of this routine that we've, you know, we've finally settled into. What, what is that looking like for you? I know you're working a lot. Yeah, I'm working a lot. So the Orange County Fair is open a week ago, a Friday ago, and I'm working a lot of hours there. So that's a really good question, Davey, to ask, because I forgot how hard that is to work a show. And I, I'm working way more than I ever in my whole career. And a lot had to do because um, my team, my coordinator and my boss all knew about my mental health condition. Actually, um, yeah, even the father worked at the same job. So like they all knew me when I got ill and now it's such an honor to work with them now when they see me better. But it is a lot, <laughs> it is a lot because um, during the, the pandemic, like I would go in and out of depression because of the lack of social social health. Like I'm high high um, not merch is another work talk. I'm um, super social, so and I, I didn't know how much how important social health was to me till I had no no social gatherings or people coming over. So um, I had to be I had to learn how to cope with that. But then straight into working the Orange County Fair, I worked every day Friday half shift. Saturday full shift, Sunday half shift. I was like, "Wow, this this really this is really hard," <laughs> because I wasn't I mentally was getting ready, but I didn't have the experience before working that much. So, um, and prior to that week, Davy, I had like coordinated a bonfire for work, and we had to prepare for OC fair and do setup. So I took already like two PRNs last week to prepare for that weekend, um, only to do it again this weekend, and then after this week, I have five days in a row. So um, I have to have people, PRNs or medications take as needed. So I have bipolar one. So when, um, when I'm out like overwhelmed and, 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 and about to get into a manic state, um, I can feel it and the people around me can sense it based on my, my dialogue, my, my language, my, the speed of my speech, um, how jumbly my thoughts are. And also the most the, be, the the most important indicator is how much sleep I'm getting. So once I'm like going from like regular sleep of seven to six hours of sleep, and all of a sudden I'm like four to five, that's already danger zone because once I go to the next day, it's under four hours. Oh man, it's um the, the Sally that no one wants to see except my kids. My kids. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew what parents were. Um, yes. So back to. Back to work. So I took those and they actually calmed me down. So I took my PRNs or anti anxiety to really chill me out. Um, but yeah, I had a, a I, I survived the first weekend. Today's Thursday. So luckily I had four days off. But I remember that Monday, um, a few days ago, I didn't feel good till like six o'clock PM because <laughs> I was so exhausted. So um, yeah, there's a lot to go into um, how it is. Well, this is totally different though, like, because I, I don't typically work like, you know, 40, hour, 40 hours in three days. Um, that's very rare. But it is, this is my kind of job where I do shows and stuff. And I'm in sales. So doing to, aside from PRN, to sort of protect your mental health. Are you doing any sort of like proactive self-care right now? I went to the Korean spa on Thursday. No joke. <laughs> Are they open? <laughs> In Orange County, that's where I live, girl. <laughs> oh, I need a Korean spa in my life. Yeah, um, no, it really, it helped a lot. So Korean spas, because okay. they first, uh, when she, I really wanted a scrub, but what they do, they did uh, a facial and a massage. And then okay. I just chill in the clay, the clay saunas and the ice saunas. And I do work there too, but it's really chill. So I spent like six hours in a Korean spa. Oh, is this the salt room with your computer? What a dream. Yeah. Right? No, I, I was watching yeah. Loki. I was in the the red UV place, red UV uh -huh. rays, and I was watching Loki okay. <laughs> on my iPad. Um, so that's number one for me is a some type of massage just to release it out. And then I've been, I see my back too. Um, my um, I hurt my back a couple weeks ago. I think I told you. It's a, not mm -hmm. a good story. But I have to ice my back um, and that, that calms me down. Um, I've been drinking a lot of chamomile tea and okay. the, the stress relieving tea when I can't okay. sleep. 
because uh, I, I just found that caffeine really messes me up. Caffeine and other, other, I already take drugs already. I might as well take, you know, try to limit, <laughs> limit, um, limit the drugs or the, you know, that I uh, take because it, this gonna, there's going to be a side effect anyway after. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and so one of the things that you and I had talked about when you interviewed me was kind of like what my, what my yellow and orange flags look like for depression, you know, for someone who's managing bipolar, what are there ways, are there signs that you have before that you can get to before, um, like you're not sleeping and there's, you know, the rapid speech and all these things. All right. So those, I remember that interview because <laughs> you're a therapist, yeah, yeah, you're studying to be a therapist. So you had these things. Um, okay. No, I'm just really, I've spent a lot of time in therapy. It's <laughs> All right, so um, if you don't, you don't have to. No, I do. I just I have friends that know, like mm -hmm. they know if they know I'm out too much, they'll say go home, in the most loving way, but the most stern way. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard now because the same those same friends are not as available because they're transitioning to other parts of life, so they're not mm -hmm. as available for me, which was mm -hmm. sad for me initially. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. my friends. But that's part of growth, you know? You, you, you know, you have your friends now and you go learn with other friends. That's part, that's, that's how you grow. Mm -hmm. it's if, I just, if I just stay with one set of friends, then that's too comfortable and then there's no growth. Um, so that, um, definitely I have to track my cycle because that's the, 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 the most um, intense it is. So at least I can prepare for when I'm getting my period of like, you know, what I put in my, my schedule. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, the red flag is that week. <laughs> okay. Because okay, someone with bipolar, okay, someone with bipolar, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a mood disorder. It's a mood disorder, but it's also a lot of instability between depression and mania. So I take medication just to have the stability. I still have, like, yeah, I'm still me, but I still have to have that stability right there. Um, so I've been learning more. It doesn't get, it doesn't get easier. I just get more aware and build capacity. I would love it to be easy. I would love it to be easy. I saw a heart. <laughs> I think that's that Doug, Doug from Sacramento. He says, hey. I, oh, um, I know Doug. He's our trainer from um, Trainer and Voice. Um, NAMI Sacramento has a great social media feed. I'm always on oh, there. Yeah. So, seeing what they're Is that doing. him again? Uh, yes, just hearts all over from Doug. We this is my it. first time on this end, so I can't, I don't know. What this is actually your second time on that end, isn't it? No. Because oh, this, this your you're second right. Episode. How come I can't see yeah. your face? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, all right. So COVID's coming to an end. How are your, um, how is the rest of your family? Um, and like your kind of transition are they watching out for you or you know what's what's going on there are they tired well, of it i moved out of my parents house five years ago and i uh -huh. finally moved out out on my own three months ago mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. <laughs> it was funny though because whenever i would move out my mom would be like are you sure you have enough money every time because she has she's warranted too because I lived with her for 30, 30 years, uh, 30 plus years. And she was there when I was getting SSI. She was there when I was getting Medi-Cal. She, she knew my, um, my patterns of mis mismanaging my money. So whenever she says that, I don't get that mad at her. I still get annoyed because, you know, I'm, I'm her daughter. Um, so even when I move out here, it's like my rent here is about the same as me living with roommates. And she still says, like, hey, like, do you, can you afford it? I was like, mom, <laughs> can you be more encouraging, please? <laughs> but like I said, you know, she saw more evidence of me being ill than me being well. So can't really hate her all, hate her all hard on that one. Um, so she does. I moved out primarily because so my sister can live there with her children. So because when we were living together, me and Lisa, oh, man, it was like every day, every hour, you know, let's pick a fight. It was so unhealthy for all of us. So luckily, I was. You guys just seem up. like, you guys just seem like you are peas in a pod when you do your interviews and when you're together. 
Davey, we only been friends since I was 35. We only been friends. So how am I now? 39. How am I? 38. Crap. Where's my daughters? How am I? I'm 38. We've only been friends since I moved out. So that was what 2018. Mm -hmm. So the interview sounds great because, like, you know, my mom was in the room with her. So like, who would know her less? Me. <laughs> If you listen to that interview again, that you hear mumbling, rah, 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 rah. that's my mom talking. See my sister. Oh, you're wearing lipstick. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, well, I so made how sure else? I made sure that nothing was too red because I didn't want to get that kind of no. attention from you. No, that uh, that's that stigma from uh, the Catholic moms. It's it's rough. Um, that's the, how, that's the, yeah. that's um that's a inside joke, guys. You had to watch the episode. My sister or my mom just like totally puts me on blast a different way than my dad does. How are your daughters, um, how are your daughters handling this transition? Like the transition back into the world, you transitioning back into the world, you guys not being together constantly? Well, actually we were together more. Um, so I moved to Orange County to be with my kids more, more. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't know this about my story is that, um, so I had my two daughters, um, they're like 19 months apart. And it was really difficult because the father's family had a lot of stigma regarding me. And I was, I was really ill, like really unstable, um, would call the, um, the father and his mom, like all kinds of times a day, like three in the morning, like yelling at them, whatever. But that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. So my goal was to live closer to my children because I, I was living in Almani with my parents. So luckily that happened, uh, 2014, um, a position opened for my other job here in Orange County. So I was able to work there and my boss was able to let me stay at the office and bring my kids. And it was great. And it gave me keys. I cleaned the office. And I got keys to the office. So I, um, cleaned, uh, my kids had a printer, they had a computer, they had a Wi-Fi. When one of them got sick, um, when someone gets sick at school, they can't be at school, but the other kid, you know, is in school because she's not sick. So one time I was able to bring one of my kids, my sick kids to the office on the couch. And I think we were watching a dolphin's tail while she was getting better. While I picked, and then, then time came up um, ending a school. So I was able to, to get the other kid on, you know, when they, when they're done with school. So um, it was hard. It was really hard because my I lived in in LA County. My kids are in Orange County, and that's why that's was the schedule was like. There was visitation schedule. It was, it was such a weird schedule. It was every first, second, and fourth weekend, and because and I can get them every Wednesday after school. So that was what it was um, before I lived here. So when I lived here a couple years ago, it was easier to see them more because they lived here, you know. And then yeah. the father couldn't rely on me to pick them up because they lived here. So, um, so that was the schedule. Um, it was still like that w w um, weird schedule, but you know, he can call me more to pick them up and vice versa. So in terms of its um, presentation schedule it was like 30, 40, 60. And then the pandemic hit and he doesn't want to like pick up the kids all the time at the, if I'm available. So it went to every other week. So that was, that was huge. That was huge for me. Because um, right. we've been going to mediation every summer to go over the summer schedule with my girls. And we just stopped it like three years ago. And, and Davey, that is such a uplifting feeling. It's like like grief, you know, like, oh, you got to go to the mediator again, the mediation to do freaking schedule. Even the mediator said, you guys again, oh my gosh, it's such a complicated schedule. And I was like, thanks for being encouraging. <laughs> So, um, thanks for the help and hope. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the hope. Thanks for the hope. Um, but no, I get it. It was, you know, we caused this, we caused me and the father caused this drama. So then, um, luckily, yeah, when the, when the pandemic hit, it was easier for him and me to have to switch off the kids every other week because we we're not going to school because the kids didn't have school. And then we're in Orange County. So finally, uh, I think the fall, they're allowed to go back to school in person on the cohort, hybrid cohort. So one daughter wanted, went one day, her freshman year high school was in the middle of the fall. She thought it was so depressing to see all the masks, all the plastic coverings. And she didn't want that to be her, her thing about high school, first day of high school. 
the younger one, uh, no, she was fine. <laughs> she went to hybrid, hybrid class. Uh, she went to school every Tuesday, uh, every Thursday and Friday. So they do have a lot, they do have different last names. Um, that's another story for another time. They were their full sisters. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, the, with that, um, the younger one had a, an okay time, but it was, it was, it wasn't really fun because her initial class was like 15 people. Then the last week of the, of the semester, it was like five or three, you know? So like they had a hard time. They, it's a different hard time because they got busy. So like we can do, we were more, more flexible. So I went to a wedding in um, Texas in like the middle of uh, November and went to another wedding in June. And like if other school years, we'd never do this, but we did or I did and they came with me. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they were, they learned how to crochet, uh, crochet, knit, um so so they they got busy but they're teenagers they would sleep in they watched oh they watch a lot of korean dramas and a lot of a lot of a lot of uh ma like maga, maga. Drama. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so they got busy so it just reminds me of when i was me and my sisters were kids we didn't have internet so we were so bored watching three channels we saw like you know a lot of like uh, my parents used to watch when i have to live that that soap opera I did watch all the I Love Lucy's, all the, <laughs> what's it called? Gilligan's Island, uh, Mr. Belvedere. So this reminds me, like, how my kids are spending their time reminds me of how my sisters spend my time, our time together. But that was during the summer. This is during the school year. What's the one lear word you've learned um, from your teenagers this month? Are we still the word? That's old. Oh, I learned that from my other job. That, I learned that okay. from 2018. Never mind. Sorry. Um, what, the new word. Uh, it doesn't change as much. Oh, but, oh. I wish they were here. Um, so, how do you know? That's old. Being too. a, um, at least like my memories of being a teenager just like nightmare when I look back on it like mental health nightmare um uh, what you know since your family is so open about mental health how have like have you have you and your girls been having more conversations I know this year has been really challenging for her teenagers like the rates of like suicidality suicide ideation cutting like all these things are like skyrocketing but you know how are your are girls talking to you more about this? Are they comfortable talking about it? No, they're not. The older one, maybe a little bit more. The younger one, like, doesn't talk to me at all. I'll bring it up for sure. Like, they'll be, I'll like, for, I'll like, do an interview in the room with them here. <laughs> you know, but like, I'll, I'll do a presentation or ETS in my, in my room with them in background while they're working on something. But it was funny because um, the younger one had like a mental health project and didn't ask me at all for help. And I didn't know about it until the older one said, J Jazz, mommy works for Nami. Why don't you ask her? <laughs> so no, they don't, they don't, we, I, I bring it up, you know, just to see where they're at, you know, um, when uh, one of them has like a panic attack or anxiety, uh, I try it. So that's really hard too, because sometimes I'm really sleepy and I don't want to help her. Um, when, like, but then again, I, I, I'm very cautious because I don't want my kids to be on medication so early in their life, if we can prevent it, you know? Um, so, but I think what I hear from each other is that they give their friends advice on mental health. <laughs> But we don't talk about it. Like they don't Okay, so they're ending the stigma themselves. Yes, yes, yes. You know, which is great, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think that's and, I, and also people have to remind me that, you know, even though I'm a cool mom, I'm still their mom and not not every kid wants to talk to their mom about everything. No. Um Okay, so kind of final question. Um one year is done. What does a year two of mental health in me look like? What, what do we want? What do we want to see? What's your year vision? two? Oh my gosh. I want to talk to um, Trouty, Trouty to see, or even you. 
Um, this is, I, yeah, first ones to, to get them, get these interviews on YouTube. So sorry for those that I interviewed. I didn't send you the letter to, of consent to put it on YouTube. So we need to though, we definitely need to, because all these stories are so precious and um, uplifting. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a different year because hopefully we'll be fully open. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ish. I know LA is back to covering with the mask again, but it's, yeah, it's a different vibe. Um, I like to have to spread out outside of LA County. That'd be really cool. You know, cause there's some um, like Doug from Sacramento, you know, he's really cool Doug to interview calls. stuff. <laughs> Pardon me? What'd you say? He, Doug should call. We can get him on. Yeah. I was numbered. <laughs> He's our trainer. He's a national trainer. So yeah, I would like it to be outside of LA County. Um, this is one girl I always, I promote her a lot is, um, ah, is Shannon, Shannon Jacquard. She wrote the book, um, somewhere in my book, the case it's on, uh, on her brother and suicide prevention and that story. So I'd love like to interview her. Um, but yeah, there's, there's all these people that I see that I'd love to, to talk to, um, gets me a chance to get into their space and, the, see what they're willing to share. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're always looking for people. It doesn't have to be celebrities, guys. It don't have to be celebrities. It doesn't have to be um, that you have a serious mental illness. It's just someone who's willing to talk about their story and their struggle and, you know, provide hope for others. Because the reason we have these interviews is that everyone is different. We know that. So we're going to hear things differently from what people are, what people share. And that's a huge step into recovery is to walk together and to be educated and um, to have that patience and love that your loved one will get better. Yes. I want all the EDs. I want to interview all the EDs um, and call them out. Paul Stansberry, Wayne uh, Messenger. Doug wants to know where he can see the videos and um, I would say that they are on our Instagram TV feed. Um, they also are shortly to be debuted on our YouTube channel, um, and they will be uh, numbered the same way that they are numbered on this. So you can always go back and find them again um, if you want to, you know, watch 34 and see Romy and then uh, Romy Cigario or you know whoever, whoever, whoever Davy. Um, I don't know who else there was. All right, so sophomore year of Mental Health and Me starts today, wearing a mask. <laughs> Um, a little depressed. Is it Jess or is it Jade that's in her sophomore year? Um, they don't start yet. They start like in a couple in a couple months. Couple months. Okay. A couple, yeah, in a month. Okay. Yeah. So um, the older one, she's a sophomore. Younger one is she's a freshman. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm also upset we're wearing a mask. Please pass that on. Um, but uh, I think it's gonna be good. I think it's gonna be good. I'm excited about what this looks like. Um, is there anything, uh, anything else? Any other words of words that you want to close with? Once again, it's a Minority Mental Health Month. I know Nula, uh, Nami, LA, Nula has a thing going on on Sunday. I would check that out. They do every year on the BB Moore, Negro Camel Moore. Um, what they do, uh, they, they, I, I'm so amazed of how like they made that into a national. They went to the Capitol and made it into a national. Um, uh, recognition mm -hmm. that Minority Mental Health Month. So that's my shout to them. A, um, they are also doing on the 29th, like a Zoom, a Zoom thing, um, and you mm -hmm. with uh, in partnership with Mary California, which Perfect. you can, yeah. um, which you can register for. I think on their website and Mary California's website. And yep. In our Instagram feed. Yeah. So my my last <laughs> words. Oh my gosh. I, mean, I think I think it's sophomore year of mental health and me. Um, last words of mental health and me episode 35. Oh, I didn't think about this. I always ask this question too. Um, <laughs> thanks for being on guys. Thanks for watching with watching these interviews. Thanks for walking with us. There's a lot of family and a lot of friends out there that are still alone. You know, even me, I still feel alone. My friends know it because I bother them to bother me, but just knowing about this and um, recognizing it, looking for warning signs in family or friends, even if they have them, um, the best way to help someone is by educating yourself. 
I mentioned that in the earlier, earlier in this interview, is the best way to help someone is through education because through education, we know how to help them better. If we're not educated, things get lost. Um, communication gets lost, feelings get hurt, and you know people's lives are damaged or and or lost. So definitely look up your next, um, look up the next NAMI, the family, family class. There you can learn how to educate yourselves on mental health and mental health conditions. If you are a peer, someone that has a mental illness, we have a class called Peer to Peer, um, a similar structure to, to family, family, but these are ways to help yourself and help others. So those are my two cents. Get it? Deuces. Um, we, uh, yeah, we also have mental health first, first aid, which I know uh, Nami Glendale, Nami San Fernando Valley are constantly offering. Um, okay. We'd love to see you. Um, cool. Well, then I will let you go, Sally. Thank you so much for in inviting me to uh, sit in this seat. Um, and we will, uh, we will talk soon. Yeah, sounds good. All I right. think next episode, next month, we'll be starring Charles T. Winters, our new executive director for NAMI GLAC. On that note, see you later. Yes. Bye. Bye.